few people have had the insight to uh, put in an application for the Seeking Common Ground application that was a nationwide program. Now, the reason we wanted to do that, our soil scientist, Mike Smith, and our ecologist, Bob Campbell, had done a lot of research up here, and from the soils work that they had done, and what existing aspen you see on the mountain today, they figured that we had lost 60 to 70 percent of the aspen on this mountain. Due to invasion of subalpine fir mainly, um, lack of fire, a combination of things that left this mountain in a very unhealthy state. So we applied for the Seeking Common Ground status and we were awarded, I think it was one of three in the nation that we got uh, that uh, status and that allowed us to have some monies that came with that package. Now that money wasn't a lot and I'm going to share the difference with you because today that money is a whole different package and the application process is totally different. So we used to apply for money to every individual conservation group, Mule Deer Foundation, Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, Turkey Federation, the list goes on and on, but it was an individual application for each organization and an individual completion report for each organization. I remember one year I got $12,000 and we thought we were really, really doing well and we were going to put $12,000 on the ground and that was big time. But with $12,000 from four different groups, you can only do a postage stamp size treatment. But we were happy with that because that's about all you could get done in those days. And we put that money on the ground. Uh, in my group, we started to do a lot of Dixie Harrow work in the sagebrush. Dixie Harrow is an aggressive pipe tooth harrow that will, uh, with a once over treatment, will. Uh, thin the sagebrush 50% and twice over we'll thin it 90%. As you look down across the valley here, the BLM adopted our program and those patterns you see in the sagebrush are a combination of Dixie Harrow and some chainings that go clear down through this valley and uh, Kendall will talk about those a little bit more about how many acres and, and what's been done there. But we. We did about 9,000 acres of Dixie Harrow work here on Monroe Mountain to improve uh, AUMs for livestock and wildlife. Some of those needed seeds, some of those didn't at this high elevation. A lot of the places already have a good understory and we were just trying to reduce the uh, sagebrush components so that the grasses and forbs would continue to dominate and provide as high AUMs as they could. So. Compare that now with where we've come through the years as the UPCD program developed and WRI today, we put in one proposal, we file one completion report, <clears throat> and we get thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. The Richfield District this year, Jason remind me, is 900 and 1.1 million dollars and we did that with well, there's two applications for this district. One in this Aspen ecotype and one in the pinion juniper type. So kudos to the, to the state and all the conservation groups that have worked together to pool their money together, to put this process together, to make it easier for us on the ground to apply for millions of dollars, if you will, to, uh, to work on an ecosystem size project because what we've started to see is, Vance backed me up, he told me a few years ago we were sitting at uh, highest buck to doe ratios and highest deer numbers on this mountain in 30 years, 20, anyway. 20 at least. Yep. That doesn't happen just overnight, that happens with what you see with all the projects that is visible from here and it goes on and on down the mountain and down the valley. So as we look back at the uh, Seeking Common Ground process, which was uh, a process that worked together across fence boundaries, across private. We worked on private. We worked with our partners. 
Uh, at that time, there was a lot of animosity between livestockmen, uh, division folks, forest folks, and it was a time to just put all that aside and work together. And as Steve Daniels talked about today, this is a barn raising type of event, and we're working together for a common cause, and that's that uh, common ground concept is still at, at work today and is, is very well uh, accepted by a lot of people. And as we go back along the route here today, uh, and as you noticed coming here, there's fenced, high fences along areas that have been treated. Those treatments were uh, clear cut to, re to restore aspen. And because there's such a, a great elk population on Monroe Mountain, and there's livestock grazing, we found if we don't do large scale projects that we have to fence those areas or the aspen will not succeed. So I have 17 different exclosures that equal 22 miles of high fence on this mountain. And they are only successful because we utilize the dedicated hunter program that the Division of Wildlife Resources has in place. I try to have a dedicated hunter around all 22 miles once a week to make sure that a tree hasn't blown over on that fence and animals can get inside and uh, utilize that young aspen that is making its growth back. And you'll see that on the way back out, how successful that is. As we start to do large, large scale aspen, we'll disperse the, or aspen treatments, we'll disperse that uh, ungulate distribution across the landscape and we won't have to fence and so that's where we're at right now. So Kelly will tell us about some of the projects that he's working on on a large scale with uh, fire and mechanical and that's all part of making the, the footprint bigger to distribute that ungulate pressure. So with that I'm going to turn the time over to I think you're next Kelly. This, what you're seeing right out here is uh, the Monument Peak project. Uh, it's also, it also included a little bit of the Monroe Aspen once that decision was signed uh, last December. Uh, we added a little bit of that in there. So it's a, it was a 4,400 acres total is what ended up being treated uh, with prescribed fire. Basically beginning a year ago, um, between March and uh, about now, mid-June, um, is about when we, we wrapped it up. Uh, but uh, over a series, we you know we started in the low elevations, a lot of the, the more of the brush, mixed mountain brush down there, um, kind of where we drove up uh, at the bottom there, and then uh, we worked basically kind of followed the snow line up uh, using prescribed fire, um, you know some small organizations and things, um, and then as we got to this upper end, um, it was kind of ended up being a lot bigger organization just due to the closeness to the private property and. Uh, and whatnot, but uh, we ended up uh, kind of a type one burn organization that uh, came in and uh, burned these this unit here, uh, along with the stuff over by Kusharam, the Indian Peak stuff. Um, all aerial ignition, uh, at least this upper end, the, the bottom end we all did with uh, more of hand ignition. Um, you know, following the snow lines up, and then we did a PSD uh, aerial uh, ignition with this this por portion up here for a stand replacement burn. Um, I, backing up just a little bit, there was, you know, a lot of that, the, the clear cut we've seen with the high fence coming in, that was kind of precursor to some of this just due to the private property and to have that done and the piles burnt and out of place, that was kind of, that's part of the Monument Peak project as well. Um, there was about 400 acres, I think, there that uh, uh, was cut with the, the, the timber program did, but uh, and that's kind of when we kicked in to burn the piles and uh, work on this. Um, I guess the cost per acre on this ended up being about a hundred and I think eight dollars an acre is what I figured as close as I could to, to, to burn this. Um, again, that's it's cheaper it's cheaper that way with the bigger scale. If you go to smaller scale, a lot of times you have a lot higher cost per acre. And it was like I said, like Craig said, it was 
a lot of help through the WRI uh, funding to, to make this happen over here. Um, I know I'm short-winded, but... To, That's pretty good. Well, uh, as far as, I think on our fuels reports, it was about 90 tons per acre, if I remember right, mm -hmm. was about in there of, of dead and down prior. I mean, you, you see uh, kind of where you drove where the black was on the one side and the, it was kind of a before and after, if you want to, I mean, that was really similar. It was, the road broke it up, but uh, so it's a very, very thick stand, very, I mean, hard to walk through type stand. Um, you know, so it's a good, a lot of, a lot of good regrowth as of now. I mean, uh, as far as uh, August last year, we had about two foot tall uh, aspen. I mean, when we, it, the ignition was about June, I think it was June 10th. So that's the, that's the time frame. So it, response was well, we seeded as well after, um, immediately right after. Um, give an overview of the watershed restoration initiative and kind of the partnerships uh, that went on with with the Monument Peak fire and some of the the projects that we'll see today as we go through phase one and phase two. Uh, the opportunity here as we as we look and as we kind of set up this tour uh, we looked at this as a vantage point and you can see just in this grass valley all the treatments uh, like what Craig kind of mentioned uh, from, from BLM treatments early on uh, before WRI mm -hmm. to what the BLM's done, what the Forest Service has done clear through this valley and, and it extends on uh, farther than you can see down there past past Otta Creek but um, kind of over on this far side you can there's a bullhog project that was done uh, a couple years ago you've got Prater Slopes with it, which was a lop and scatter project you've got a lot of Dixie Harrow work that's been done in the bottoms and I think we're, we're approaching just in this valley alone, probably better than 20,000 acres uh, treated over the course of time. Once you add in stuff up on the Parker Mountain Plateau, stuff north on the sand ledges, stuff that Craig's done, you know, we're, we're probably pushing over 100,000 acres, probably treated. Uh, and now a lot of that stuff come before WRI, and a lot of it's come since WRI, since 2006. So, a lot of the information that was passed out by Jody uh, was queried off our WRI database. Uh, it's broke down by counties and it's broke down by funding. So we, with this, we just got to have a lot of partners. And I, I feel um, really, really thankful to be working with this, this Monroe Mountain Working Group, working with Kelly and Craig and Jason, um, working with the guys that have that have done the hard work trying to get the NEPA going. Um, this is kind of where, where I fit in and, and try to help them achieve their goals um, you know and, and putting the, the contractors out so as we as we do the contracting uh, we do it on a competitive bid and it kind of streamlines everything we've got some contractors that are that are very reputable uh, that can do a lot of the work for us the mechanized stuff that you'll see later today uh, worked with Vince Pace on doing a lot of the, the fencing work uh, and have contractors come up and do the, the high fences and uh, there's just a lot of partnerships that, that go on uh, with this size of, of uh, scale of implementation. So you've got a lot of the sportsman's groups um, that have put a lot of money into it. Department of Agriculture uh, with Tom Tippetts. Uh, the permittees have been great. We did a pipeline project a couple years ago that was kind of uh, part of this Monroe Mountain. And those permittees uh, went after Department of Agriculture money and so it was a great opportunity for a lot of funding sources to come together. Um, Mary O'Brien, we worked with her last year on a cooperative agreement through the Grand Canyon Trust and, and they supported uh, some fencing and worked with her on, on a lot of that, that information. Along with a lot of the studies over the past couple years, they've put together some sage grouse studies down kind of in Grass Valley and, and uh, Kashurm area and, and they're starting to see a lot of movements of the birds uh, that has got collars on them and I was visiting with Vance a little bit and uh, I think we're up to about 20 maybe 30 birds but they're starting to see how they move back and forth in and amongst all the treatments so they are working they are benefiting wildlife they are benefiting livestock uh, everything that we do uh, needs to be multi-purpose as we've talked about before
Uh, so, so let me speak for the trees. Um, I've been working on this forest for, for 10 plus years. Uh, I came out in 2007 with Bob Campbell. I never worked in Aspen Forest, and we spent uh, 10 days just driving the forest, just making observations. And it's been incredible what we've learned. This place, elevation, you know, s above 7,500 feet across our state is, is a critical driver of our economy, of, of our health. Um, and, and there's just a lot of important values up here for us. I, I've done research in a lot of different places and I can't think of a greater example where one species has such a large disproportional impact on the rest of the biology in the system than this one. Um, quaking aspen uh, has had a huge impact on, on the structure of this forest and its formation. Um, and just a couple of things I'll point out that, that we've learned through the research we've done. You'll notice that the, the, the forest is defined by the aspen. If we look down in this stand right here, the aspen's about 30 years older than any other tree. And the forest marches as the aspen marches. You'll notice that there's a little aspen stand that popped out. You notice what followed out, the aspen out, was, were the other conifer species. And what I can tell you is that if the aspen disappears, then so does the rest of the forest. Where we've had areas where aspen has declined and, and left the forest system, the forest goes with it. Um, it it's, it's really, really critical. Uh, and with the aspen, the other forest tree species comes the habitat that all of the animal life depends upon. Um, and it becomes impoverished when aspen's lost from the landscape. So what we've been really focused on and, and thinking about, uh, there's these, these little aspen suckers coming up. Aspen has defense against animals that, that, that would like to eat it. Uh, during early summer into midsummer right now, uh, the animals are focused on other species for forage. But as we get into late July, uh, into mid-September, aspen really becomes a focal species. It maintains its nutrition, its nutritional quality, and so it becomes a real focus for the wildlife and the livestock. And in air, its best defense is when it's 20 feet tall. Its second best defense is if you go taste those leaves, you'll find out they don't taste very good. They're extremely bitter. Uh, if I took the leaf, dried it down, and analyzed, about 25% of the leaf dry weight uh, is a defense compound called phenylglycosides. And if you, if you bit into those leaves, you'd be spitting for about half an hour. Very distasteful, very bitter. And what we've discovered is that um, disturbance really is important for the, for the health of the system. And that what is important is the aspen root system. What survived that fire was the aspen root system. And that's what's coming back. That's the regeneration of the forest. And the, the conifers are all dead. It'll be seed source from the other trees establishing under the canopy that this, this regenerating aspen's forming that will bring this forest back. What's dangerous for us in terms of habitat is that when fire does occur, and we want fire in these systems, is these little aspen roots send up suckers, and in that July-August time period, they receive a lot of focus from the, these ungulate species. The, the, the big game and, and the livestock. And we found areas where three successive years, the aspen's trying to push up those suckers and regenerate the forest, but heavy browsing causes death of the root system. And it, those are the areas where the forest, 20 years later, is no longer there. You go over to white ledges, and the only place the forest is regenerating is where we had fences. The aspen regenerated, and now little conifers are starting to come up underneath the aspen. So this is, is really critical um, that we, and you'll see how, how, how important it is. We're putting up hundreds of thousands of dollars of fences to protect the asp and those root systems and, and to assure that regeneration is going to be successful. Our research has shown that two things really matter if you're not going to put up fences. The first is the size of the, the disturbance of the fire, the bigger the better, and the more severe the fire, the better. So we want as much mortality as possible to really help the vigor of the root system to, to regenerate. And what, the, what that will do is high burn severity conditions in large areas, the aspen regenerates more quickly, the growth is faster, it's denser, and the defense compounds that leaves produce are produced at a much higher level when the fires are big and, and the burn condition is severe. 
and that's where we found success and that that research has really informed what we did right here we're concerned about any potential for regeneration on this mountain because of the failures that have occurred before and the, and the loss of the forest that's occurred and we asked this question is this big enough to saturate the effect of the ungulates so that regeneration will be successful and we think it, it is and you can see evidence of that with the green the regenerating in the aspen out there but this is really this is really a validation of the research that's been done over the last 10 years and i think what we're, we're seeing is success um, where we've seen failure is when we've done prescribed burns very small low burn severity that's where we've had failure and that's how we've done prescribed burns almost exclusively in the past so this has really changed our mindset in terms of how we have to deal with with management and fire on this landscape we need fire because our research also shows that as conifers get older they competitively exclude the aspen and if fire doesn't return to the system we'll lose them through competitive exclusion from the conifers so we have this dilemma of we need fire to happen on the landscape but in a way that disperses the ungulate herbivory the eating of the aspen in a way that the aspen can regenerate successfully